crouching in the shadows behind the great doorposts, towering on either side. But the gates were shattered and cast down. Aragorn smote to the ground the captain that stood in his path, and the rest fled in terror of his wrath. The company swept past them and took no heed of them. Out of the gates they ran and sprang down the huge and age-worn steps, the threshold of Moria. Thus, at last, they came beyond hope under the sky and felt the wind on their faces. They did not halt until they were out of bowshot from the walls. Dimril Dale lay about them. The shadow of the misty mountains lay upon it. But eastwards there was a golden light on the land. It was but one hour after noon. The sun was shining. The clouds were white and high. They looked back. Dark yawned the archway of the gates under the mountain shadow. Faint and far beneath the earth rolled the slow drum beats. Doom. A thin black smoke trailed out. Nothing else was to be seen. The dale all around was empty. Doom. Grief, at last, wholly overcame them, and they wept long. Some standing and silent. Some cast upon the ground. The drum beats faded. Alas, I fear we cannot stay here any longer, said Aragorn. He looked towards the mountains and held up his sword. Farewell, Gandalf, he cried. Did I not say to you, if you pass the doors of Moria, beware? Oh, last that I spoke true. What hope have we without you? He turned to the company. We must do without hope, he said. At least we may yet be avenged. Let us gird ourselves and weep no more. Come. We have a long road and much to do. They rose and looked about them. Northward, the dale ran up into a glen of shadows, between two great arms of the mountains, above which three white peaks were shining, Kelebdil, Fanuithol, Karadras, the mountains of Moria. At the head of the glen, a torrent flowed like a white lace over an endless ladder of short falls, and a mist of foam hung in the air about the mountain's feet. Yonder is the dim real stair, said Aragorn, pointing to the falls. Down the deep cloven way that climbs beside the torrent, we should have come. If their fortune had been kinder. Oh, gladness, less cruel, said Gimli. There he stands, smiling in the sun. He shook his fist at the furthest of the snow-capped peaks and turned away. To the east, the outflung arm of the mountains marched to a sudden end, and far lands could be described beyond them, wide and vague. To the south, the misty mountains receded endlessly as far as sight could reach, Less than a mile away, and a little below them, for they still stood high up on the west side of the dale, there lay a mere. It was long and oval, shaped like a great spearhead thrust deep into the northern glen, but its southern end was beyond the shadows under the sunlit sky. Yet its waters were dark. A deep blue, like clear evening sky seen from a lamplit room. Its face was still and unruffled. About it lay a smooth sward shelving down on all sides to its bare, unbroken rim. There lies the Miramir, deep Kelezaran, said Gimli sadly. I remember that, he said. May you have joy of the sight, but we cannot linger here. How long I shall journey, here I have joy again. It is I that must hasten away, and he that must remain. The company now went down the road from the gates. It was rough and broken, fading to a winding track beneath heather and wind that thrust amid the cracking stones. But still it could be seen that once long ago a great paved way had wound upwards from the lowlands of the Dwarf Kingdom. 
In places, there were ruined works of stone beside the path, and mounds of green topped with slender birches, or fir trees sighing in the wind. An eastward bend led them hard by the sward of Miramir, and there, not far from the roadside, stood a single column broken at the top. That is during stone, cried Gimli. I, I cannot pass without turning aside for a moment to look at the wonder of the dale. Be swift then, said Aragorn, looking back towards the gates. The sun sinks early. The orcs will not maybe come out till after dusk, but we must be far away before nightfall. The moon is almost spent, and it will be dark tonight. cried the dwarf, springing from the road. I would not have you kill a Zara. He ran down the long green slope. Frodo followed slowly, drawn by the still blue water in spite of hurt and weariness. Sam came up behind. Beside the standing stone, Gimli halted and looked up. It was cracked and weather-worn, and the faint runes upon its side could not be read. This pillar marks the spot where Durin's first looked into the mirror mirror, said the dwarf. Let us look ourselves once, ere we go. They stooped over the dark water. At first, they could see nothing. Then slowly... They saw the forms of the encircling mountains mirrored in a profound blue, and the peaks were like plumes of white flame above them. Beyond, there was a pace of sky. There, like jewels sunk in the deep, shone glinting stars, though sunlight was in the sky above. Of their own stooping forms, no shadow could be seen. Oh, Kilitsaram, fair and wonderful, said Gimli. There lies the crown of Durin till he wakes. Farewell. He bowed and turned away and hastened back up the green sward to the road again. What did you see? said Pippin to Sam. But Sam was too deep in thought to answer. The road now turned south and went quickly downwards, running out from between the arms of the dale. Some way below the mare they came on a deep well of water, clear as crystal, from which a freshet fell over a stone lip and ran glistening and gurgling down a steep rocky channel. Here is the spring from which the silver load rises, said Gimli. Do not drink from it. It is icy cold. Soon it becomes a swift river, and it gathers water from many other mountain streams, said Aragorn. Our road leads beside it for many miles, for I shall take you by the road that Gandalf chose. First, I hope to come to the woods where the silver load flows into the great river. Out yonder. They looked as he pointed, and before them they could see the stream leaping down from the trough of the valley, and then running on and away into the lower lands until it was lost in a golden haze. That is the fairest of all the dwellings of my people. There are no trees like the trees of that land, for in the autumn their leaves fall not, but turn to gold. Not till the spring comes and the new green opens do they fall, and then the boughs are laden with yellow flowers, and the floor of the wood is golden, and golden is the roof, and its pillars are of silver, for the bark of the trees is smooth and grey. So still our songs in America would say, my heart would be glad if I were beneath the eaves of that wood, that it was spring to me. My heart would be glad even in the winter, said Aragorn. But it lies many miles away. Let us... For some time, Frodo and Sam managed to keep up with the others. But Aragorn was leading them at a great pace. And after a while, they lagged behind. They had eaten nothing since the early morning. Sam's cut was burning like fire, and his head felt light. In spite of the shining sun, the wind seemed chill after the warm darkness of Moria. He shivered. Frodo felt every step more painful as he gasped for breath. At last Legolas turned, and seeing them now far behind, he spoke to Aragorn. The others halted, and Aragorn ran back, calling to Boromir to come with him. Holy Frodo, he cried, full of concern. So much has happened this day, and we have such need of haste that I have forgotten that you were hurt. And Sam too. And we have done nothing to ease you as we ought, though all the orcs of Moria are after us. Come now. There I will do what I can for you. Come, Boromir. We will carry them. 
Soon afterwards they came upon another stream that ran down from the west and joined its bubbling water with a hurrying silver load. Together they plunged over a fall of green-hued stone and foamed down into a dell. About it stood fir trees, short and bent, and its sides were steep and clothed with heart's tongue and shrubs of wortleberry. At the bottom there was a level space through which the stream flowed noisily over shining pebbles. Here they rested. It was now nearly three hours after noon, and they had come only a few miles from the gates. Already the sun was westering. While Gimli and the two younger hobbits kindled a fire of brush and firwood and drew water, Aragorn tended Sam and Frodo. Sam's wound was not deep, but it looked ugly, and Aragorn's face was grave as he examined it. After a moment, he looked up with relief. Good luck, Sam, he said. Many have received worse than this in payment for the slaying of their first orc. The cut is not poisoned, as the wounds of orc blades too often are. It should heal well when I have tended it. Bathe it when Gimli has heated water. He opened his pouch and drew out some withered leaves. They are dry and some of their virtue has gone, he said. But here I have still some of the leaves of Athalas that I gathered near Weathertop. Crush one in the water and wash the wound clean and I will bind it. Now it is your turn, Frodo. Uh, I'm all right, said Frodo, reluctant to have his garments touched. All I needed was some food and a little rest. No, said Aragorn. We must have a look and see what the hammer and anvil have done to you. I still marvel that you are alive at all. Gently he stripped off Frodo's old jacket and worn tunic and gave a gasp of wonder. Then he laughed. The silver corslet shimmered before his eyes like the light upon a rippling sea. Carefully he took it off and held it up, and the gems of it glittered like stars, and the sound of the shaken rings was like a tinkle of rain in a pool. Look! <laughs> Look, my friends. Here's a pretty hobbit skin to wrap an elven princeling in. If it were known that hobbits had such eyes, all the hunters of Middle-earth would be riding to the Shire. Heroes of all the hunters in the world would be in vain, said Gimli, gazing at the mail in wonder. It is a mithril coat. Mithril! I have never seen or heard tell of one so fair. Is this a coat that Gandalf spoke of? Huh. And he undervalued it. But it was well given. I have often wondered what you and Bilbo were doing so close in his little room, <laughs> said Merry. Huh. Ah, bless the old hobbit. I love him more than ever. <laughs> I hope we get a chance of telling him about it. There was a dark and blackened bruise on Frodo's right side and breast. Under the mail, there was a shirt of soft leather, but at one point the rings had been driven through it into the flesh. Frodo's left side was also scored and bruised where he had been held against the wall. While the others set the food ready, Aragorn bathed the herds with water in which Athelas was steeped. The punch and fragrance filled the dell, and all those who stooped over the streaming water felt refreshed and strengthened. Soon Frodo felt the pain leave him, and his breath grew easy. Though he was stiff and sore to the touch for many days, Aragorn bound some soft pads of cloth at his side. The mail is marvelously light, he said. Put it on again if you can bear it. My heart is glad to know that you have such a coat. Do not lay it aside even in sleep unless fortune brings you where you are safe for a while. And that will seldom chance while your quest lasts. When they had eaten, the company got ready to go on. They put out the fire and hid all traces of it. Then, climbing out of the dell, they took to the road again. They had not gone far before the sun sank behind the westward heights, and great shadows crept down the mountain sides. Dusk veiled their feet, and mist rose in the hollows. Away in the east, the evening light lay pale upon the dim lands of distant plain and wood. Sam and Frodo, now feeling eased and greatly refreshed, were able to go at a fair pace, and with only one brief halt, Aragorn led the company on for nearly three more hours. It was dark. Deep night had fallen. There were many clear stars, but the fast waning moon would not be seen till late. Gimli and Frodo were at the rear, walking softly and not speaking, listening for any sound upon the road behind. At length Gimli broke the silence. Not a sound but the wind. He said, There are no goblins near, or my ears are made of wood. 
It is to be hoped that the orcs will be content with driving us from Moria. And maybe that was all their purpose. And they had nothing else to do with us. With the ring. Their orcs will often pursue foes for many leagues into the plain, if they have a fallen captain to avenge. Frodo did not answer. He looked at Sting, and the blade was dull. Yet he had heard something. Or thought he had. As soon as the shadows had fallen about them, and the road behind was dim, he had heard again the quick patter of feet. Even now he heard it. He turned swiftly. There were two tiny gleams of light behind. Or for a moment he thought he saw them, but at once they slipped aside and vanished. What is it? said the dwarf. Answered Frodo. I thought I heard feet, and I thought I saw a light. Like eyes. I have thought so often since we first entered Moria. Gimli halted and stooped to the ground. I hear nothing but the night speech of plant and stone, he said. Come, let us hurry. The others are out of sight. The night wind blew chill up the valley to meet them. Before them, a wide grey shadow loomed, like poplars in the breeze. Lothlorien! cried Legolas. Lothlorien! We have come to the eaves of the Golden Wood. Alas, that it is winter. Under the night, the trees stood tall before them, arched over the road and stream that ran suddenly beneath their spreading boughs. In the dim light of the stars, their stems were grey, and their quivering leaves a hint of fallow gold. Lothlorien! said Aragorn. Glad I am to hear again the wind in the trees. We are still little more than five leagues from the gates, but we can go. Here let us hope that the virtue of the elves will keep us tonight from the peril that comes behind. If elves indeed still dwell here in the darkening world, said Gimli. It is long since any of my folk journeyed hither, back to the land whence we wandered in ages long ago, said Legolas. But we hear that Lothlorien is not yet deserted, for there is a secret power here that holds evil from the land. Nevertheless, its folk are seldom seen, and maybe they dwell now deep in the woods and far from the northern border. Indeed, deep in the wood they dwell, said Aragorn, and sighed as if some memory stirred in him. We must fend for ourselves tonight. We will go forward in a short way until the trees are all about us, and then we will return aside from the path and seek a place to rest in. He stepped forward, but Boromir stood irresolute and did not follow. He said, What other fair way would you desire? said Aragorn. A, a plain road, though it led through a hedge of swords, said Boromir. Strange paths has this company led, and so far to evil fortune. Against my will we passed under the shades of Moria to our loss, and now we must enter the golden wood, you say. But of that perilous land we have heard in Gondor, and it is said that few come out who once go in, and of that few none have escaped unscathed. Say not unscathed. But if you say unchanged, then maybe you will speak the truth, said Aragorn. But law wanes in Gondor, Boromir, if the city of those who once were wise. They now speak evil of Lothlorien. Believe what you will, there is no other way for us unless you would go back to Moria Gate, or scale the pathless mountains, or swim the great river all alone. Then lead on, said Boromir. But it is perilous. Perilous indeed said Aragorn. Fair and perilous. But only evil need fear it, or those who bring some evil with them. Follow. They had gone little more than a mile into the forest when they came upon another stream flowing down swiftly from the tree-clad slopes that climbed back westward towards the mountains. They heard it splashing over a fall away among the shadows on their right. Its dark hurrying waters ran across the path before them and joined the silver load in a swirl of dim pool among the roots of trees. Nimrodel, said Legolas. Of this stream the Sylvan elves made many songs long ago, and still we sing them in the north, remembering the rainbow on its falls, and the golden flowers that floated in its foam. All is dark now, and the bridge of Nimrodel is broken down. I will bathe my feet, for it is said that the water is healing to the weary. He went forward and climbed down the deep cloven bank and stepped into the stream. Follow me, he cried. The water is not deep. Let us wade across. On the further bank we can rest, and the sound of the falling water may bring us sleep and forgetfulness. Grief.
One by one they climbed down and followed Legolas. For a moment Frodo stood near the brink and let the water flow over his tired feet. It was cold, but its touch was clean. And as he went on, it mounted to his knees. He felt that the stain of travel and all weariness was washed from his limbs. When all the company had crossed, they sat and rested and ate a little food. And Legolas told them tales of Lothorian that the elves of Mirkwood still kept in their hearts, of sunlight and starlight upon the meadows by the great river before the world was grey. At length a silence fell and they heard the music of the waterfall running sweetly in the shadows. Almost Frodo fancied that he could hear a voice singing, mingled with the sound of water. Do you hear the voice of Nimrodel? asked Legolas. Uh, I will sing you a song of the maiden Nimrodel, who bore the same name as the stream beside which she lived long ago. It is a fair song in our woodland tongue, but this is how it runs in the west of speech, as some in Rivendell now sing it. In a soft voice, hardly to be heard amid the rustle of the leaves above them, he began, And every day there was of old a shining star by day. Her mantle white was hemmed with gold, her shoes of silver gray. A star was bound upon her brows, a light was on her hair, as sun upon the golden boughs in glory and the fair. Her hair was long, her limbs were white, as fair she was and free, and in the wind she went as light as leaf on linden tree. Beside the foes of Nimrodel, by water clean and cool, her voice was falling, silver fell into the shining pool. Where now she wanders, none can tell, in sunlight or in shade. For lost of yore was Nimrodel, and in the mountain strayed. The elven ship in haven grey, beneath the mountain lee, awaited her for many a day beside the roaring sea. A wind by night in northern lands arose, and loud it cried, and drove the ship from elven strands across the streaming tide. When dawn came dim, the land was lost, the mountains sinking grey. Beyond the heaving waves that tossed their plumes of blinding spray. Amroth beheld a fading shore now low beyond the swell, and cursed the faithless ship that bore him far from Nimrodel. Of old he was an elven king, a lord of tree and glen, when golden there were boughs in spring in fair Lothlorien. From helm to sea they saw it leap as arrows from the string, and dive into the water deep as mew upon the wing. The wind was in his flowing hair, the foam about him shone, Afar they saw him strong and fair, go riding like a swan. But from the west has come no word, and on the hither shore, no tidings elven folk have heard of Amroth evermore. The voice of Legolas faltered, and the song ceased. I cannot sing any more, he said. That is but a part, for I have forgotten much. It is long and sad, for it tells how sorrow came upon Lothlorien, Lorien of the Blossom, when the dwarves awakened evil from the mountains. The dwarves did not make the evil, said Gimli. I said not so. Yet evil came, answered Legolas sadly. Then many of the elves of Nimrodil's kindred left their dwellings and departed, and she was lost far in the south in the passes of the White Mountains. And she came not to the ship where Amroth, her lover, waited for her. But in the spring, when the wind is in the new leaves, the echo of her voice may still be heard by the falls that bear her name. And when the wind is in the south, the voice of Amroth comes up from the sea, for Nimrodel flows into the Silverlode, that elves call Celebrant, 
and Celebrant into Anduin the Great, and Anduin flows into the Bay of Belfalas, whence the elves of Lorien set sail. But neither Nimrodel nor Amroth ever came back. It is told that she had a house built in the branches of a tree that grew near the falls, for that was the custom of the elves of Lorien, to dwell in the trees, and maybe it's so still. Therefore they were called the Galadrim, the tree people. Deep in their forest the trees are very great. The people of the woods did not delve in the ground like dwarves, nor build strong places of stone before the shadow came. And even in these latter days, dwelling in the trees might be thought safer than sitting on the ground, said Gimli. He looked across the stream to the road that led back to Dindrill Dale, and then up to the roof of dark boughs above. Your words bring good counsel, Gimli, said Aragorn. We cannot build a house. But tonight we will do as the Galadrim and seek refuge in the treetops if we can. We have sat here beside the road already longer than was wise. The company now turned aside from the path and went into the shadow of the deeper woods, westward along the mountain stream away from Silverload. Not far from the falls of Nimrodil, they found a cluster of trees, some of which overhung the stream. Their great, great tusks were of mighty girth, but their height could not be guessed. I will climb up, said Legolas. I'm at home among the trees, by root or bough, though these trees are of a kind strange to me, save as a name in song. Melan, they are called, and are those that bear the yellow blossom, but I've never climbed one. I will see now what is their shape and way of growth, said Pippin. Ertz. Then dig a hole in the ground, said Legolas, if that is more after the fashion of your kind. But you must dig swift and deep if you wish to hide from all. He sprang lightly up from the ground and caught a branch that grew from the trunk high above his head. But even as he swung there for a moment, a voice spoke suddenly from the tree shadows above him. Shadow. It said in commanding tone, and Legolas dropped back to earth in surprise and fear. He shrank against the bowl of the tree. Stand still. He whispered to the others. Do not move or speak. There was a sound of soft laughter over their heads, and then another clear voice spoke in an elven tongue. Frodo could understand little of what was said, for the speech that the Sylvan folk east of the mountains used among themselves was unlike that of the West. Legolas looked up and answered in the same language. <laughs> Asked Merry. They're elves, said Sam. Can't you hear voices? Yes, they are elves, said Legolas. And they say that you breathe so loud that they could shoot you in the dark. Sam hastily put his hand over his mouth. But they say also that you need have no fear. They have been aware of us for a long while. They heard my voice across the Nimrodel, and knew that I was one of their northern kindred, and therefore they did not hinder our crossing. And afterwards, they heard my song. Now they bid me climb up with Frodo, for they seem to have had some tidings of him and of our journey. The others they asked to wait a little and to keep watch at the foot of the tree until they have decided what is to be done. Out of the shadows a ladder was let down. It was made of rope, silver grey and glimmering in the dark. And though it looked slender, it proved strong enough to bear many men. The glass ran lightly up and Frodo followed softly. Behind came Sam, trying not to breathe loudly. The branches of the Malon tree grew out nearly straight from the trunk and then swept upward, but near the top of the main stem divided into a crown of many bows, and among these they found that there had been built a wooden platform, or flat, as such things were called in those days. The elves called it a talon. It was reached by a round hole in the center through which the ladder passed. When Frodo came at last up onto the flat, he found Legolas seated with three other elves. They were clad in shadowy gray and could not be seen among the tree stems unless they moved suddenly. They looked up, and one of them uncovered a small lamp that gave out a slender silver beam. He held it up, looking at Frodo's face and Sam's. Then he shut off the light again, and spoke words of welcome in his elven tongue. Frodo spoke haltingly in return. Welcome. The elf then said again in the common language, speaking slowly, We seldom use any tongue but our own. For we dwell now in the heart of the forest, and do not willingly have dealings with any other folk. Even our kindred in the north are sundered from us. 
but there are some of us who will go abroad for the gathering of news and the watching of our enemies, and they speak the languages of other lands. I am one. Haldir is my name. My brothers, Rumil and Orofin, speak little of your tongue. But we have heard rumors of your coming, for the messengers of Elrond passed by Lorien on their way home up the Dimro stair. We had not heard of hobbits, of halflings, for many a long year, and did not know that any yet dwelt in Middle-earth. You do not look evil, and since you come with an elf of our kindred, we are willing to befriend you, as Elrond asked. Though it is not our custom to lead strangers through our land. But you must stay here tonight. How many are you? Eight, said Legolas. Myself, four hobbits, and two men. One of whom, Aragorn, is an elf friend of the folk of Westerness. The name of Aragorn, son of Erathorn, is known in Lorien, said Haldir. And he has the favor of the lady. All then is well. But you have yet spoken only of seven. The eighth is a dwarf, said Legolas. A dwarf, said Haldir. That is not well. We have not had dealings with the dwarves since the dark days. They are not permitted in our land. We cannot allow him to pass. But he's from the Lonely Mountain, one of Dane's trusty people, and friendly to Elrond, said Frodo. Uh, Elrond himself chose him to be one of our companions, and he has been brave and faithful. The elves spoke together in soft voices, and questioned Legolas in their own tongue. Very good, said Haldir at last. We will do this, though it is against our liking. If Aragorn and Legolas will guard him, and answer for him, he shall pass. But he must go blindfolded through Lothlorien. But now we must debate no longer. Your folk must not remain on the ground. We have been keeping watch on the rivers ever since we saw a great troop of orcs going north towards Moria along the skirts of the mountains many days ago. Wolves are howling on the woods' borders. If you have indeed come from Moria, the peril cannot be far behind. Tomorrow early you must go on. The four of us shall climb up here and stay with us. We do not fear them. There is another talon in the next tree. There the others must take refuge. You, Legolas, must answer to us for them. Call us if anything is amiss. And have an eye on that dwarf. Legolas at once went down the ladder to take Haldir's message, and soon afterwards Merry and Pippin clambered up on the high flat. They were out of breath and seemed rather scared. There, said Merry, panting. We have locked up your blankets, as well as our own. Strider has hidden up all the rest of your baggage in a steep drift of leaves. You had no need for your burden, said Haldir. It is cold in the treetops in winter, though the wind tonight is in the south. But we have food and drink to give you that will drive away the night chill. And we have skins and cloaks to spare. The hobbits accepted this second and far better supper very gladly. Then they wrapped themselves warmly, not only in the fur cloaks of the elves, but in their own blankets as well, and tried to go to sleep. But weary as they were, only Sam found that easy to do. Hobbits do not like heights and do not sleep upstairs, even when they have any stairs. The flat was not at all to their liking as a bedroom. It had no walls, not even a rail. Only on one side there was a light-plated screen, which would be moved and fixed in different places according to the wind. Pippin went on talking for a while. I hope that if I do get to sleep in this bed loft that I shan't roll off. Once I do get to sleep, said Sam, I shall go on sleeping whether I roll off or no. And the less said, the sooner I'll drop off, if you take my meaning. Frodo lay for some time awake, and looked up at the stars, glinting through the pale roof of quivering leaves. Sam was snoring at his side long before he himself closed his eyes. He could dimly see the grey forms of two elves sitting motionless with their arms about their knees, speaking in whispers. The other had gone down to take up his watch on one of the lower branches. At last, lulled by the wind in the bows above, and the sweet murmur of the falls of Nimrodel below, Frodo fell asleep, with the song of Legolas running in his mind. Late in the night he awoke. The other hobbits were asleep. The elves were gone. The sickle moon was gleaming dimly among the leaves. The wind was still. A little way off, 
he heard a harsh laugh and the tread of many feet on the ground below. There was a ring of metal. The sounds died slowly away and seemed to go south on into the wood. A head appeared suddenly through the hole in the flat. Frodo sat up in alarm and saw that it was a grey-hooded elf. He looked toward the hobbits. Well, what is it? said Frodo. Yeah, said the elf in a hissing whisper, and cast onto the flat the rope ladder rolled up. Orcs, said Frodo. What are they doing? But the elf had gone. There were no more sounds. Even the leaves were silent, and the very falls seemed to be hushed. Frodo sat and shivered in his wraps. He was thankful that they had not been caught in the ground, but he felt that the trees offered little protection except concealment. Orcs were as keen as hounds on a scent, it was said, but they could also climb. He drew out Sting. It flashed and glittered like a blue flame, and then slowly faded again and grew dull. In spite of the fading of his sword, the feeling of immediate danger did not leave Frodo. Rather, it grew stronger. He got up and crawled into the opening and peered down. He was almost certain that he could hear stealthy movements at the tree's foot far below. Not elves, for the woodland folk were altogether noiseless in their movements. Then he heard, faintly, a sound like sniffing, and something seemed to be scrabbling on the bark of the tree trunk. He stared down into the dark, holding his breath. Something was now climbing slowly, and its breath came like a soft hissing through the closed teeth. Then coming up close to the stem, Frodo saw two pale eyes. They stopped and gazed upward and winking. Suddenly they turned away and a shadowy figure slipped round the trunk of the tree and vanished. Immediately afterwards, Haldir came climbing swiftly up through the branches. There was something in this tree that I have never seen before, he said. It was not an orc. It fled as soon as I touched the tree stem. It seemed to be wary and to have some skill in trees, or I might have thought it, it was one of you hobbits. I did not shoot, for I dared not arouse any cries. We cannot risk battle. A long company of orcs have passed. They crossed the Nimrod Hill, cursed their foul feet in its clean water, and they went on down the old road beside the river. They seemed to pick up some scent, and they searched the ground for a while near the place where you halted. The three of us could not challenge a hundred, so we went ahead and spoke in feigned voices, leading them on into the wood. Orofin has now gone in haste back to our dwellings to warn our people. None of the orcs will ever return out of Lorien, and there will be many elves hidden on the northern border before another night falls. But you must take the road south as soon as it is fully light. Day came pale from the east. As the light grew, it filtered through the yellow leaves of the Malorn, and it seemed to the hobbits that the early sun of a cool summer's morning was shining. Pale blue sky peeped among the moving branches. Looking through an opening on the south side of the flat, Frodo saw all the valley of the Silver Lode, lying like a sea of fallow gold tossing gently in the breeze. The morning was still young and cold when the company set out again, guided now by Haldir and his brother Rumil, Farewell, sweet cried Legolas. Frodo looked back and caught a gleam of white firm among the grey tree stems. Farewell he said. It seemed to him that he would never hear again a running water so beautiful, forever blending its innumerable notes in an endless changeful music. They went back to the path that still went on along the west side of the Silver Lode, and for some way they followed it southward. There were the prints of orc feet in the earth, but soon Haldir turned aside into the trees and halted on the bank of the river under their shadows. There is one of my people yonder across the stream, he said, though you may not see him. He gave a call like a low whistle of a bird, and out of a thicket of young trees an elf stepped, clad in grey, but with his hood thrown back, his hair glinted like gold in the morning sun. Haldir skillfully cast over the stream a coil of grey rope, and he caught it and bound the end about a tree near the bank. Celebrant is already a strong stream here, as you see, said Haldir, and it runs both swift and deep and is very cold. We do not set foot in it so far north unless we must, but these days of watchfulness we do not make bridges. 
This is how we cross. Follow me. He made his end of the rope fast about another tree, and then ran lightly along it, over the river and back again, as if he were on a road. I can walk this path, said Legolas, but the others have not this skill. Must they swim? No, said Haldir. We have two more ropes. We will fasten them above the other, one shoulder high and another half high, and holding these, the strangers will be able to cross with care. When this slender bridge had been made, the company passed over, some cautiously and slowly, others more easily. Of the hobbits, Pippin proved the best, for he was sure-footed, and he walked over quickly, holding only with one hand, but he kept his eyes on the bank ahead and did not look down. Sam shuffled along, clutching hard, and looking down into the pale eddying water as if it was a chasm in the mountains. He breathed with relief when he was safely across. Live and learn, as my gaffer used to say. He was thinking of gardening. Not of roosting like a bird, nor trying to walk like a spider. Not even my uncle Andy ever did a trick like that. When at length all the company was gathered on the east bank of the silver load, the elves untied the ropes and coiled two of them. Rumil, who had remained on the other side, drew back the last one, slung it on his shoulder, and with a wave of his hand went away, back to Nimbledel, to keep watch. Now, friends, said Haldir, you have entered the Nith of Lorien, or the Gore, as you would say, for it is the land that lies like a spearhead between the arms of Silverlode and Anduin the Great. We allow no strangers to spy out the secrets of the Nith. Few are permitted even to set foot here. As we agreed, I shall here blindfold the eyes of Gimli the Dwarf, the others may walk free for a while until we come nearer to our dwellings down in Egladin, in the angle between the waters. This was not at all to the liking of Gimli. The agreement was made without my consent, he said. I will not walk blindfolded like a beggar or a prisoner, and I am no spy. My folk have never had dealings with any of the servants of the enemy. Neither have we done harm to the elves. I am no more likely to betray you than Legolas, or any other of my companions. I do not doubt you, said Haldir. Yet this is our law. I am not the master of the law and cannot set it aside. I have done much in letting you set foot over Celebrant. Gimli was obstinate. He planted his feet firmly apart and laid his hand upon the haft of his axe. I will go forward free, he said. Or I will go back and seek my own land, where I am known to be true of where do I perish alone in the wilderness. Said Haldir sternly. Now you have come thus far, you must be brought before the Lord and the Lady. They shall judge you, to hold you, or to give you leave as they will. You cannot cross the rivers again, and behind you there are now secret sentinels that you cannot pass. You would be slain before you saw them. Gimli drew his axe from his belt. Haldir and his companions bent their bows. A plague on dwarves and their stiff necks, said Legolas. Come, said Aragorn. If I am still to lead this company, you must do as I bid. It is hard upon the dwarf to be thus singled out. We will all be blindfolded, even Legolas. That will be best, though it will make the journey slow and dull. Gimli laughed suddenly. A merry troop of fools we shall look. We'll hardly lead us all on a string like many blind beggars with one dog. But I will be content if only Legolas here shares my blindness. I'm an elf and a kinsman here, said Legolas, becoming angry in his turn. Now let us cry a plague on the stiff necks of elves, said Aragorn. But the company shall fare alike. Come, blind our eyes, Haldir. I shall claim full amends for every fall and stubbed turf you do not lead us well, said Gimli as they bound a cloth about his eyes. You will have no claim, said Haldir. I shall lead you well. And the paths are smooth and straight. Alas for the folly of these days, said Legolas. Here are all enemies of the one enemy, and yet I must walk blind while the sun is merry in the woodland under the leaves of gold. Folly of my theme, said Haldir. Indeed in nothing is the power of the Dark Lord more clearly shown than in the estrangement that divides all those who still oppose him. He had so little faith and trust we find now in the world beyond Lothlorien and less maybe in Rivendell, that we dare not by our own trust endanger our land. We live now among an island amid many perils. 
and our hands are more often upon the bowstring than upon the harp. The rivers long defend us, but they are a sure guard no more, for the shadow has crept northward all about us. Some speak of departing, yet for that it already seems too late. The mountains to the west are growing evil, to the east the lands are waste and full of Sauron's creatures, and it is rumored that we cannot now safely pass southward through Rohan, and the mouths of the great river are watched by the enemy. Even if we could come to the shores of the sea, we would find no longer any shelter there. It is said that there are still havens of the High Elves, but they are far north and west, beyond the land of the Halfling. But where that may be, though the Lord and Lady may know, I do not. You would at least guess since you have seen us, said Mary. There are elf havens west of my land, the Shire, where hobbits live. Happy folk are hobbits to dwell near the shores of the sea, said Haldir. It is long indeed since any of my folk have looked on it. Yet still we remember it in song. Tell me of the havens as we walk. I cannot, said Mary. I've never seen them. I've never been out of my own land before. And if I had known what the world outside was like, I don't think I should have had the heart to leave it. Not even to see fair Lothlorien, said Haldir. The world is indeed full of peril, and in it there are many dark places. But still there is much that is fair, and though in all lands love is now mingled with grief, it grows perhaps the greater. Some there are among us who sing that the shadow will draw back, and peace shall come again. Yet I do not believe that the world about us will ever again be as it was of old or the light of the sun as it was aforetime. For the elves, I fear it will prove at best of truce, in which they may pass to the sea, unhindered, and leave Middle-earth forever. Alas, for Lothlorien that I love, it would be a poor life in a land where no Malon grew. But if there are Malon trees beyond the great sea, none have reported it. As they spoke thus, the company filed slowly along the paths in the wood, led by Haldir while the other elf walked behind. They felt the ground beneath their feet, smooth and soft, and after a while they walked more freely, without fear of hurt or fall. Being deprived of sight, Frodo found his hearing and other senses sharpened. He could smell the trees and the trodden grass. He could hear many different notes in the rustle of the leaves overhead, the river murmuring away on his right, and the thin clear voices of birds in the sky. He felt the sun upon his face and hands when they passed through the open glade. As soon as he set foot upon the far bank of Silverlode, a strange feeling had come upon him, and it deepened as he walked on into the nath. It seemed to him that he had stepped over a bridge of time into a corner of the elder days, and was now walking in a world that was no more. In Rivendell there was memory of ancient things. In Lorien, the ancient things still lived on in the waking world. Evil had been seen and heard there. Sorrow had been known. The elves feared and distrusted the world outside. Wolves were howling on the wood's borders, but on the land of Lorien, no shadow lay. All that day the company marched on, until they felt the cool evening come and heard the early night wind whispering among many leaves. Then they rested, and slept without fear upon the ground for their guides would not permit them to unbind their eyes, and they could not climb. In the morning they went on again, walking without haste. At noon they halted, and Frodo was aware that they had passed out under the shining sun. Suddenly he heard the sound of many voices all around him. The marching host of elves had come up silently. They were hastening toward the northern borders to guard against any attack from Moria, and they brought news, some of which Haldir reported. The marauding orcs had been waylaid and almost all destroyed. The remnant had fled westward towards the mountains and were being pursued. A strange creature also had been seen, running with bent back and with hands near the ground, like a beast, and yet not of beast shape. It had eluded capture, and they had not shot it, not knowing whether it was good or ill, and it had vanished down the silver load southward. Also, said Haldir, they bring me a message from the Lord and Lady of the Galadrim. You are all to walk free, even the dwarf Gimli, 
It seems that the lady knows who and what is each member of your company. New messages have come from Rivendell, perhaps. He removed the bandages first from Gimli's eyes. Your pardon, he said, bowing low. Look on us now with friendly eyes. Look and be glad, for you are the first dwarf to behold the trees of the Nith of Lorien since Durin's day. When his eyes were in turn uncovered, Frodo looked up and caught his breath. They were standing in an open space, and to the left stood a great mound, covered with a sward of grass and green as springtime in the elder days. Upon it, as a double crown, grew two circles of trees. The outer had bark of snowy white, and were leafless, but beautiful in their shapely nakedness. The inner were malon trees, of great height, still arrayed in pale gold. High amid the branches of a towering tree that stood in the center of all there gleamed a white flat. At the feet of the trees, and about the green hillsides, the grass was studded with small golden flowers, shaped like stars. Among them, nodding on slender stalks, were other flowers, white and palest green. They glimmered as a mist amid the rich hue of the grass. Over all, the sky was blue, and the sun of afternoon glowed upon the hill and cast long green shadows beneath the trees. Behold, you are come to Kerin Amroth, said Haldir. For this is the heart of the ancient realm as it was long ago, and here is the mound of Amroth where in happier days his high house was built. Here ever bloom the winter flowers in the unfading grass, the yellow Eleanor and the pale Nifredil. Here we will stay a while and come to the city of the Galadrim at dusk. The others cast themselves down upon the fragrant grass, but Frodo stood a while, still lost in wonder. It seemed to him that he had stepped through a high window that looked on a vanished world. A light was upon it for which his language had no name. All that he saw was shapely, but the shape seemed at once clear-cut, as if they had been first conceived and drawn at the uncovering of his eyes, and ancient as if they had endured for ever. He saw no color but those he knew, gold and white and blue and green, but they were fresh and poignant, as if he had at that moment first perceived them and made for them names new and wonderful. In winter here no heart could mourn for summer or for spring. No blemish or sickness or deformity could be seen in anything that grew upon the earth. On the land of Lorien there was no strain. He turned and saw that Sam was now standing beside him, looking round with a puzzled expression, and rubbing his eyes as if he was not sure that he was awake. It's sunlight and bright day right enough, he said. I thought the elves were all for moon and stars. But this is more elvish than anything I've ever heard tell of. I feel as if I was inside a song, if you take my meaning. Haldir looked at them, and he seemed indeed to take the meaning of both thought and word. He smiled. You feel the power of the Lady of the Galadriel, he said. Would it please you to climb with me up Kerin Amroth? They followed him as he stepped lightly up the grass-clad slopes. Though he walked and breathed, and about him living leaves and flowers were stirred by the same cool wind as fanned his face, Frodo felt that he was in a timeless land that did not fade, or change, or fall into forgetfulness. When he had gone and passed again into the outer world, still Frodo, the wanderer of the Shire, would walk there, upon the grass among Eleanor and Nifredil and fair Lothlorien. They entered the circle of white trees. As they did so, the south wind blew upon Kerin Amroth and sighed among the branches. Frodo stood still, hearing far off great seas upon beaches that had long ago been washed away, and seabirds crying whose race had perished from the earth. Haldir had gone on and was now climbing to the high flat. As Frodo prepared to follow him, he laid his hand upon the tree beside the ladder. Never before had he been so suddenly and so keenly aware of the feel and texture of a tree's skin, and of the life within it. He felt a delight in wood, and the touch of it, neither as forester nor as a carpenter. It was the delight of the living tree itself. As he stepped out at last upon the lofty platform, 
Haldir took his hand and turned him towards the south. Look this way first, he said. Frodo looked and saw, still at some distance, a hill of many mighty trees, or a city of green towers, which it was he could not tell. Out of it, it seemed to him that the power and light came that held all the land in sway. He longed suddenly to fly like a bird to rest in that green city. Then he looked eastward, and saw all the land of Lorien running down to the pale gleam of Anduin, the great river. He lifted his eyes across the river, and all the light went out, and he was back again in the world he knew. Beyond the river the land appeared flat and empty, formless and vague, until far away it rose again like a wall, dark and drear. The sun that lay on Lothlorien had no power to enlighten the shadow of that distant height. There lies the fastness of southern Mirkwood, said Haldir. It is clad in a forest of dark fir, where the trees strive one against another, and their branches rot and wither. In the midst upon the stony height stands Dol Guldur, where long the hidden enemy had his dwelling. We fear that now it is inhabited again, and with power sevenfold. A black cloud lies often over it of late. In this high place you may see the two powers that are opposed to one another, and ever they strive now in thought. But whereas the light perceives the very heart of the darkness, its own secret has not been discovered. Not yet. He turned and climbed swiftly down, and they followed him. At the hill's foot Frodo found Aragorn, standing still and silent as a tree, but in his hand was a golden bloom of Eleanor and a light was in his eyes. He was wrapped in some fair memory, and as Frodo looked at him, he knew that he beheld things as they once had been in the same place. For the grim years were removed from the face of Aragorn, and he seemed clothed in white, a young lord tall and fair, and he spoke words in the elvish tongue to one whom Frodo could not see. Arwen van Imelda, Namarie he said, and then he drew a breath, and returning out of his thought, he looked at Frodo and smiled. Here is the heart of Elvendom on earth, he said, and here my heart dwells ever. Unless there be a light beyond the dark roads that we still must tread, you and I. Come with me. And taking Frodo's hand in his, he left the hill of Cerin Amroth, and came there never again as living man. The sun was sinking behind the mountains, and the shadows were deepening in the woods when they went on again. Their paths now went into thickets, where the dusk had already gathered. Night came beneath the trees as they walked, and the elves uncovered their silver lamps. Suddenly they came out into the open again and found themselves under a pale evening sky pricked by a few early stars. There was a wide treeless space before them, running in a great circle and bending away on either hand. Beyond it was a deep foss, lost in soft shadow, but the grass upon its brink was green, as if it glowed still in the memory of the sun that had gone. Upon the further side there rose into a great height a green wall encircling a green hill, thronged with malon trees, taller than any they had yet seen in all the land. Their height could not be guessed, but they stood up in the twilight like living towers. In their many tired branches, and amid their ever-growing leaves countless lights were gleaming, green and gold and silver. Haldir turned towards the company. Welcome to Karas Galathon, he said. Here is the city of the Galadrim, where dwell the Lord Caliborn, and Galadriel, the Lady of Lorien. But we cannot enter here, for the gates do not look northward. We must go round to the southern side, and the way is not short, for the city is great. There was a road paved with white stone running on the outer brink of the foss. Along this they went westward, with the city ever climbing up like a green cloud upon their left. And as the night deepened, more lights sprang forth until all the hills seemed afire with stars. They came at last to a white bridge, and crossing found the great gates of the city. They faced southwest, set between the ends of the encircling wall that here overlapped, and they were tall and strong, and hung with many lamps. 
Haldir knocked and spoke, and the gates opened soundlessly, but of guards Frodo could see no sign. The travellers passed within, and the gates shut behind them. They were in a deep lane between the ends of the wall, and passing quickly through it they entered the city of the trees. No folk could they see, nor hear any feet upon the paths, but there were many voices, about them and in the air above. Far away up on the hill they could hear the sound of singing falling from on high like a soft rain upon leaves. They went along many paths and climbed many stairs until they came to the high places and saw before them amid the wide lawn a fountain shimmering. It was lit by silver lamps that swung from the boughs of trees, and it fell into a basin of silver, from which a white stream spilled. Upon the south side of the lawn there stood the mightiest of all the trees. Its great smooth bowl gleamed like grey silk, and up it towered, until its first branches far above opened their huge limbs under the shadowy clouds of leaves. Beside it a broad white ladder stood, and at its foot three elves were seated. They sprang up as the travellers approached, and Frodo saw that they were tall and clad in grey mail, and from their shoulders hung long white cloaks. Here dwell Celeborn and Galadriel, said Haldir. It is their wish that you should ascend and speak with them. One of the elf wardens then blew a clear note on a small horn, and it was answered three times from afar above. I will go first, said Haldir. Let Frodo come next, and with him Legolas. The others may follow as they wish. It is a long climb for those that are not accustomed to such stairs, but you may rest upon the way. As he climbed slowly up, Frodo passed many flats, some on one side, some on another, and some set about the bowl of the tree, so that the ladder passed through them. At a great height above the ground he came to a wide talon, like the deck of a great ship. On it was built a house, so large that almost it would have served for a hall of men upon the earth. He entered behind Haldir, and found that he was in a chamber of oval shape, in the midst of which grew the trunk of the great Malon, now tapering towards its crown, and yet making still a pillar of wide girth. The chamber was filled with a soft light, its walls were green and silver and its roof of gold. Many elves were seated there. On two chairs beneath the bowl of the tree and canopied by a living bough, there sat, side by side, Celeborn and Galadriel. They stood up to greet their guests. After the manner of elves, even those who were accounted mighty kings, very tall they were, and the lady no less tall than the lord, and they were grave and beautiful. They were clad wholly in white, and the hair of the lady was of deep gold, and the hair of the lord Celeborn was of silver, long and bright, but no sign of age was upon them, unless it were in the depths of their eyes. For these were keen as lances in the starlight, and yet profound, the wells of deep memory. Haldir let Frodo before them, and the Lord welcomed him in his own tongue. The Lady Galadriel said no word, but looked long upon his face. Sit now beside my chair, Frodo of the Shire, said Celeborn. When all have come, we will speak together. Each of the companions he greeted courteously by name as they entered. Welcome, Aragorn, son of Arathorn, he said. It is eight and thirty years of the world outside since you came to this land, and those years lie heavy on you, but the end is near, for good or ill. Here lay aside your burden for a while. Welcome, son of Thranduil. Too seldom do my kindred journey hither from the north. Welcome Gimli, son of Gloin. It is long indeed since we saw one of Durin's folk in Karaz Galathon, but today we have broken our long law. May it be a sign that though the world is now dark, better days are at hand, and that friendship shall be renewed between our peoples. Gimli bowed low. When all the guests were seated before his chair, the Lord looked at them again. Here there are eight, he said. Nine were to set out, so said the messages. But maybe there has been some change of counsel that we have not heard. Elrond is far away, and the darkness gathers between us, and all this year the shadows have grown longer. Nay, there was no change of counsel, said the Lady Galadriel, speaking for the first time. Her voice was clear and musical, but deeper than a woman's want. Gandalf the Grey set out with the company but he did not pass the borders of this land. Now tell us where he is, for I much desired to speak with him again, 
but I cannot see him from afar, unless he comes within the fences of Lothorian. A grey mist is about him, and the ways of his feet and of his mind are hidden from me. Alas, said Aragorn, and of the grey fell into shadow. He remained in Moria, and did not escape. At these words all the elves in the hall cried aloud in grief and amazement. These are evil tidings, said Celeborn. The most evil that we have spoken here in a long years, full of grievous deeds. He turned to Haldir. Why has nothing of this been told to me before? He asked in the elven tongue. We have not spoken to Haldir of our deeds or our purpose, said Legolas. At first we were weary and danger was too close behind, and afterwards we almost forgot our grief for a time, as we walked in gladness on the fair paths of Lorien. Yet our grief is great, and our loss cannot be mended, said Frodo. Gandalf was our guide, and he led us through Moria, and when our escape seemed beyond hope, he saved us, and he fell. Tell us now the full tale. Then Aragorn recounted all that had happened upon the pass of Caradras, and in the days that followed, and he spoke of Balin and his book, and the fight in the chamber of Mazarbul, and the fire, and the narrow bridge, and the coming of the terror. An evil of the ancient world, it seemed, such as I have never seen before, said Aragorn. It was both a shadow and a flame, strong and terrible. It was a Balrog of Morgoth, said Legolas. Of all elf banes the most deadly, save the one who sits in the dark tower. Indeed I saw the bridge that which haunts our darkest dreams. I saw Dur in Spain, said Gimli in a low voice and dread was in his eyes. Alas, said Celeborn, we long have feared that under Caradras a terror slept, but had I known that the dwarves had stirred up this evil in Moria again, I would have forbidden you to pass the northern borders, you and all that went with you. And if it were possible, one would say that the last Gandalf fell from wisdom into folly, going needlessly into the net of Moria. He would be rash indeed that said that thing, said Galadriel gravely. Needless were none of the deeds of Gandalf in life. Those that followed him knew not his mind and cannot report his full purpose. But however it may be with the guide, the followers are blameless. Do not repent of your welcome to the dwarf. If our folk had been exiled long and far from Lothlorien, who of the Galadrim, even Celeborn the Wise, would pass nigh and would not wish to look upon their ancient home, though it had become an abode of dragons? Dark is the water of Keled Zaram, and cold are the springs of Kibil Nala, and fair were the many pillared halls of Khazad Dum in elder days before the fall of mighty kings beneath the stone. She looked upon Gimli, who sat glowering and sad, and she smiled. And the dwarf, hearing the names given in his own ancient tongue, looked up and met her eyes, and it seemed to him that he looked suddenly into the heart of an enemy and saw their love and understanding. Wonder came into his face, and then he smiled in answer. He rose clumsily and bowed in dwarf fashion, saying, Yet more fair is the living land of Lorien, and the Lady Galadriel is above all the jewels that lie beneath the earth. There was a silence. At length Celeborn spoke again. I did not know that your plight was so evil, he said. Let Gimli forget my harsh words. I spoke in the trouble of my heart. I will do what I can to aid you, each according to his wish and need, but especially that one of the little folk who bears the burden. Your quest is known to us, said Galadriel, looking at Frodo, but we will not here speak of it more openly. Yet not in vain will it prove, maybe, that you came to this land seeking aid, as Gandalf himself plainly purposed. For the lord of the Galadriel is accounted the wisest of the elves of Middle-earth, and a giver of gifts beyond the power of kings. He has dwelt in the West since the days of dawn, and I have dwelt with him years uncounted. For ere the fall of Nargothron, or Gondolin, I passed over the mountains, and together through ages of the world we have fought the long defeat. I it was who summoned the White Council, and if my designs had not gone amiss, I would have been governed by Gandalf the Grey, and then mayhap things would have gone otherwise. But even now there is hope left. I will not give you counsel, 
saying, Do this or do that. For not in doing or contriving, nor in choosing between this course and another, can I avail, but only in knowing what was and is, and in part also what shall be. But this I will say to you, your quest stands upon the edge of a knife. Stray but a little, and it will fail, to the ruin of all. Yet hope remains, while the company is true. And with that word she held them with her eyes, and in silence looked searchingly at each of them in turn. None save Legolas and Aragorn could long endure her glance. Sam quickly blushed and hung his head. At length the Lady Galadriel released them from her eyes, and then she smiled. Do not let your hearts be troubled, she said. Tonight you shall sleep in peace. Then they sighed and felt suddenly weary, as those who have been questioned long and deeply, though no words had been spoken openly. Go now, said Celeborn. You are worn with sorrow and much toil. Even if your quest did not concern us closely, you should have refuge in the city, until you are healed and refreshed. Now you shall rest, and we will not speak of your further road for a while. That night the company slept upon the ground, much to the satisfaction of the hobbits. The elves spread for them a pavilion among the trees near the fountain, and in it they laid soft couches. Then, speaking words of peace with fair elvish voices, they left them. For a little while the travellers talked of their night before in the treetops, and of their day's journey, and of the lord and lady, for they had not yet the heart to look further back. What did you blush for, Sam? said Pippin. You soon broke down. Anyone would have thought you had a guilty conscience. I hope it was nothing worse than a wicked plot to steal one of my blankets. I never thought no such thing, answered Sam, in no mood for jest. If you want to know, I felt as if I hadn't got nothing on, and I didn't like it. She seemed to be looking inside me, and asking me what I would do if she gave me the chance of flying back home to the Shire, to a nice little hole with a bit of garden of my own. Said Mary. Almost exactly what I felt myself. Only, only, well, I don't think I'm saying he ended lamely. All of them, it seemed, had fared alike. Each had felt that he was offered a choice between a shadow full of fear that lay ahead, and something that he greatly desired. Clear before his mind it lay, and to get it he had only to turn aside from the road and leave the quest and the war against Sauron to others. And it seemed to me too, said Gimli, that my choice would remain secret and known only to myself. To me it seemed exceedingly strange, said Boromir. Maybe it was only a test, and she thought to read our thoughts for her own good purpose, but almost I should have said that she was tempting us, and offering what she pretended to have the power to give. It need not be said that I refused to listen. The men of Minas Tirith are true to their word. But what he thought the lady had offered him, Boromir did not tell. As for Frodo, he would not speak, though Boromir pressed him with questions. She held you long in her gaze, Ringbearer, he said. Yes, said Frodo, but whatever came to my mind then, I will keep there. Well, have a care, said Boromir. I do not feel too sure of this elvish lady and her purposes. Speak no evil of the Lady Galadriel, said Aragorn sternly. You know not what you say. There is in her and in this land no evil, unless a man brings it hither himself. Then let him beware. But tonight I shall sleep without fear for the first time since I left Rivendell. And may I sleep deep, and forget for a while my grief. I am weary in body and in the heart. He cast himself down upon his couch and fell at once into a long sleep. The others soon did the same, and no sound or dream disturbed their slumber. When they woke they found that the light of day was broad upon the lawn before the pavilion and the fountain rose and fell glittering in the sun. They remained some days in Lothlorien, so far as they could tell or remember. All in the while that they dwelt there the sun shone clear, save for a gentle rain that fell at times, and passed away leaving all things fresh and clean. The air was cool and soft, as if it were early spring, and they felt about them the deep and thoughtful quiet of winter. It seemed to them that they did little but eat and drink and rest and walk among the trees, and it was enough. They had not seen the Lord and Lady again, 
and they had little speech with the elven folk, for few of these knew or would use the Westrong tongue. Haldir had bidden them farewell and gone back again to the fences of the north, where great watch was now kept since the tidings of Moria that the company had brought. Legolas was away much among the Galadrim, and after the first night he did not sleep with the other companions, though he returned to eat and talk with them. Often he took Gimli with him when he went abroad in the land, and the others wondered at this change. Now as the companions sat or walked together they spoke of Gandalf, and all that each had known and seen of him came clear before their minds. As they were healed of hurt and weariness of body, the grief of their loss grew more keen. Often they heard nearby elvish voices singing, and knew that they were making songs of lamentation for his fall, for they caught his name among the sweet, sad words that they could not understand. Mithrandir, Mithrandir, sang the elves, O Pilgrim Grey, for so they loved to call him. But if Legolas was with the company, he would not interpret the songs for them, saying that he had not the skill, and that for him the grief was still too near. A matter of tears, and not yet for song. It was Frodo who first put something of his sorrow into halting words. He was seldom moved to make song or rhyme. Even in Rivendell he had listened and had not sung himself, though his memory was stored with many things that others had made before him. But now as he sat beside the fountain in Lorien, and heard about him the voices of the elves, his thought took shape in a song that seemed to be fair to him. Yet when he tried to repeat it to Sam, only snatches remained, faded as a handful of withered leaves. When evening in the shire was grey, his footsteps on the hill were heard. Before the dawn he went away on a journey long without a word. From wilderland to western shore, from northern waste to southern hill, through dragon lair and hidden door, in darkling woods he walked at will. With dwarf and hobbit, elves and men, with mortal and Im immortal folk, with bird on bough and beast in den, in... In their own secret tongues he spoke. A, a deadly sword, a healing hand, a back that bent beneath its load, a trumpet voice, a burning brand, a weary pilgrim on the road. A lord of wisdom throned he sat, swift in anger and quick to laugh, an old man in a battered hat who leaned upon a thorny staff. He stood upon the bridge alone, and fire and shadow both defied. His staff was broken on the stone. In Khazad Doom his wisdom died. Why, you'll be the Mr. Bilbo next, said Sam. <laughs> no, I'm afraid not, said Frodo. But that is the best I can do yet. If you do have another go, I hope you'll say a word about his fireworks, said Sam. Something like this. The finest rockets ever seen. They burst in stars of blue and green. Or after thunder, golden showers came falling like a rain of flowers. Though that doesn't do them justice by a long road. Now, I'll leave that to you, Sam. Or perhaps Bilbo. But, well, I can't talk of it any more. I can't bear to think bringing the news to him. One evening, Frodo and Sam were walking together in the cool twilight. Both of them felt restless again. On Frodo suddenly the shadow of parting had fallen. He knew somehow that the time was very near when he must leave Lothlorien. What do you think of elves now, Sam? he said. I asked you the same question once before. It seems a very long while ago. But you've seen more of them since then. I have indeed, said Sam. And I reckon there's elves and elves. They're all elvish enough, but they're not all the same. Now these folk aren't wanderers or homeless, and seem a bit nearer to the likes of us. They seem to belong here, more even than hobbits do in the Shire. Whether they've made the land, or the land's made them, it's hard to say, if you take my meaning. It's wonderfully quiet here. Nothing seems to be going on, and nobody seems to want it to. If there's any magic about, it's right down deep. But I can't lay my hands on it, in a matter of speaking. You can see and feel it everywhere, said Frodo. Well, said Sam, no fireworks like poor Gandalf used to show. I wonder if we don't see nothing of the Lord and Lady in all these days. 
I fancy now that she could do some wonderful things if she had a mind. I'd dearly love to see some elf magic, Mr. Frodo. I wouldn't, said Frodo. I'm content, and I don't miss Gandalf's fireworks. But his bushy eyebrows and his quick temper, and his voice. You're right, said Sam. And I don't think I'm finding fault. I've often wanted to see a bit of magic, like, like what it tells of in old tales. But I've never heard of a better land than this. It's like being at home and on a holiday at the same time, if, if you understand me. I don't want to leave. All the same, I'm beginning to feel that if we've got to go on, then we'd best get it over. It's the job that's never started, as takes longest to finish, as my old gaffer used to say. And I don't reckon that these folk can do much more to help us, magic or no. It's when we leave this land that we shall miss Gandalf worse, I'm thinking. Said Frodo. Even as he spoke, they saw, as if she came in answer to their words, the Lady Galadriel approaching. Tall and white and fair she walked beneath the trees. She spoke no word, but beckoned to them. Turning aside, she led them towards the southern slopes of the hill of Caras Galadon. And passing through a high green hedge, they came into an enclosed garden. No trees grew there, and it lay open in the sky. The evening star had risen, and was shining with white fire above the western woods. Down a long flight of steps, the lady went into the deep green hollow, through which ran murmuring the silver stream that issued from the fountain of the hill. At the bottom, upon a low pedestal carved like a branching tree, stood a basin of silver, wide and shallow, and beside it stood a silver ewer. With water from the stream, Galadriel filled the basin to the brim, and breathed on it, and when the water was still again, she spoke. Here is the mirror of Galadriel, she said. I have brought you here so that you may look in it, if you will. The air was very still, and the dell was dark, and the elf lady beside him was tall and pale. Uh, what shall we look for, and what shall we see? asked Frodo, filled with awe. Many things I can command the mirror to reveal, she answered, and to some I can show what they desire to see. But the mirror will also show things unbidden, and those are often stranger and more profitable than which we wish to behold. What you will see, if you leave the mirror free to work, I cannot tell, for it shows things that were, and things that are, and things that may yet be. But which it is that he sees even the wisest cannot always tell. Do you wish to look? Frodo did not answer. And you? She said, turning to Sam. For this is what your folk would call magic, I believe, though I do not understand clearly what they mean, and they seem to use the same words of the deceits of the enemy. But this, if you will, is the magic of Galadriel. Did you not say that you wished to see elf magic? said Sam, trembling a little between fear and curiosity. What's going on at home? he said in an aside to Frodo. It's, it seems a terrible long time that I've been away, but there, like it is not, I'll only see the stars or, or something that I won't understand. Like as not, said the lady with a gentle laugh. But come, you shall look and see what you may, but do not touch the water. Sam climbed up on the foot of the pedestal and leaned over the basin. The water looked hard and dark. Stars were reflected in it. There's only stars, as I thought, he said. And then he gave a low gasp, but the stars went out, as if a dark veil had been withdrawn. The mirror grew grey, and then clear. There was sun shining, and the branches of trees were waving and tossing in the wind. But before Sam could make up his mind, what it was that he saw, the light faded. And oh. now he thought he saw Frodo with a pale face lying fast asleep under a great dark cliff. Then he seemed to see himself going along a dim passage and climbing an endless winding stair. It came to him suddenly that he was looking urgently for something, but what it was he did not know. Like a dream, the vision shifted and went back, and he saw the trees again. But this time they were not so close, and he could see what was going on. They were not waving in the wind, they were falling crashing to the ground. Oi! cried Sam in an outraged voice. There's that Ted Sandyman a-cutting down trees as he shouldn't. They didn't ought to be felled. 
It's an avenue beyond the mill that shades the road to Bywater. I wish I could get it, Ted. I'd fell him. But now Sam noticed that the old mill had vanished, and a large red brick building was being put up where it had stood. Lots of folk were busily at work. There was a tall red chimney nearby. Black smoke seemed to cloud the surface of the mirror. There's some devilry at work in the shire, he said. Edron knew what he was about when he wanted to send Mr. Mary back. Then suddenly Sam gave a cry and sprang away. I can't stay here, he said wildly. I must go home. They've dug a backshot row, and there's the poor gaffer going down the hill with his bits of things on a barrow. I must go home. You cannot go home alone, said the lady. You did not wish to go home without your master before you looked in the mirror, and yet you knew that evil things might well be happening in the shire. Remember that the mirror shows many things, and not all have yet come to pass. Some never come to be, unless those that behold the visions turn aside from their path to prevent them. The mirror is dangerous as a guide of deeds. Sam sat on the ground and put his head in his hands. I wish I'd never come here, and I don't want to see no more magic. He said, and fell silent. After a moment, he spoke again thickly, as if struggling with tears. No, I'll go home by the long road with Mr. Frodo, or not at all, he said. But I hope I do get back some day. If what I've seen turns out true, someone's going to catch it hot. Do you now wish to look, Frodo? said the Lady Galadriel. You did not wish to see elf magic and were content. Do you advise me to look? asked Frodo. No, she said. I do not counsel you one way or the other. I am not a counsellor. You may learn something, and whether what you see be fair or evil, that may be profitable, and yet it may not. Seeing is both good and perilous. Yet I think, Frodo, that you have courage and wisdom enough for the venture, or I would not have brought you here. Do as you will. I will look, said Frodo, and he climbed on the pedestal and bent over the dark water. At once the mirror cleared and he saw a twilit land. Mountains loomed dark in the distance against a pale sky. A long grey road wound back out of sight. Far away a figure came slowly down the road, faint and small at first, but growing larger and clearer as it approached. Suddenly Frodo realized that it reminded him of Gandalf. He almost called aloud the wizard's name, and then he saw that the figure was clothed not in grey, but in white, in a white that shone faintly in the dusk, and in its hand there was a white staff. The head was so bowed that he could see no face, and presently the figure turned aside round a bend in the road that went out to the mirror's view. Doubt came into Frodo's mind. Was this a vision of Gandalf on one of his many lonely journeys long ago, or was it Saruman? The vision now changed. Brief and small, but very vivid, he caught a glimpse of Bilbo walking restlessly about his room. The table was littered with disordered papers. Rain was beating on the windows. There was a pause, and after it many swift scenes followed that Frodo in some way knew to be part of a great history in which he had become involved. The mist cleared, and he saw a light which he had never seen before, but knew at once. The sea. Darkness fell. The sea rose and raged in a great storm. Then he saw against the sun sinking blood-red into a rack of clouds the black outline of a tall ship with torn sails riding up out of the west. Then a wide river flowing through a populous city. Then a white fortress with seven towers. And then again a ship with black sails, but now it was morning again. And the water rippled with light, and a banner bearing the emblem of a white tree shone in the sun. A smoke as of fire and battle arose. And again the sun went down in a burning red and faded into a grey mist, and into the mist a small ship passed away, twinkling with lights. It vanished, and Frodo sighed, and prepared to draw away, but suddenly the mirror went altogether dark, as dark as if a hole had opened in the world of sight, and Frodo looked into emptiness, in the black abyss. There appeared a single eye that slowly grew until it filled nearly all the mirror. So terrible was it that Frodo stood rooted, unable to cry out or withdraw its gaze. The eye was springy with fire, but was itself glazed, yellow as a cat's, watchful and intent. 
and the black slit of its pupil opened on a pit, a window into nothing. Then the eye began to rove, searching this way and that, and Frodo knew with certainty and horror that among the many things that it sought he himself was one, but he also knew that it could not see him. Not yet, not unless he willed it. The ring that hung upon his chain about his neck grew heavy, heavier than a great stone, and his head was dragged downwards. The mirror seemed to be growing hot, and curls of steam were rising from the water. He was slipping forward. Do not touch the water, said the Lady Galadriel softly. The vision faded, and Frodo found that he was looking at the cool stars twinkling in the silver basin. He quickly stepped back, shaking all over, and looked at the lady. I know what it was that you last saw, she said, for that is also in my mind. Do not be afraid, but do not think that only by singing amid the trees, nor even by the slender arrows of elven bows, is this land of Lothlorien maintained and defended against its enemy. I say to you, Frodo, that even as I speak to you, I perceive the Dark Lord and know his mind, or all of his mind that concerns the elves, and he gropes ever to see me in my thought. But still, the door is closed. She lifted up her white arms and spread out her hands towards the east in a gesture of rejection and denial. Erendil, the evening star, most beloved of the elves, shone clear above. So bright was it that the figure of the elven lady cast a dim shadow on the ground. Its rays glanced upon a ring about her finger. It glittered like polished gold, overlaid with silver light, and a white stone in it twinkled as if the elven star had come down to rest upon her hand. Frodo gazed at the ring and with awe, for suddenly it seemed to him that he understood. Yes, she said, divining in his thought. It is not permitted to speak of it, and Elrond could not do so, but it cannot be hidden from the ring-bearer, and one who has seen the eye. Verily it is in the land of Lorien, upon the finger of Galadriel, that one of the three remains. This is Nenya, the ring of adamant, and I am its keeper. He suspects, but he does not know, not yet. Do you not see now wherefore your coming is to us as this footstep of doom? For if you fail, then we are laid bare to the enemy. Yet if you succeed, then our powers is diminished, and Lothlorien will fade, and the tides of time will sweep it away. We must depart into the west, or dwindle to a rustic folk of dell and cave, slowly to forget, and to be forgotten. Frodo bent his head. 